This is something that if you're writing your book, you need to put some juicy stories in there and always insert the vulnerability. So my backstory is that um, I have chronic Lyme disease and I was diagnosed in 2009. So if you haven't noticed, my shoes, shoes are part of my brand. So Lyme disease, I was initially diagnosed with lupus. Lyme disease is kind of like MS, lupus, osteoarthritis, chronic fatigue, and all these things all added together, including dementia. And yeah, I was diagnosed with that as well. Um, and there's really no protocol, there's no cure. So for four years, I stayed in bed, watching the world go by, wondering what had happened. I was like, all right, I'm already 40, life is half past, at least I got to do some things prior. You know, at least I had my kids, at least I did some things. But it really killed me that I felt like there was no future. And so there were so many days that I ended up just crying. And while everybody else in the house slept, I would be in the bathroom crying. And my husband didn't know, like I don't even know if today he knows that this is what happened while he was sleeping. And this part of my life was just a reevaluation. I had so much time to myself to think about all the things that I had done for other people, the, the things that I tried to be, who I tried to be for other people. And I had kept saying no to myself and yes to everybody else. And I kept saying, and we as women, you know, we're so good at putting other people first. We're so good at saying, you know what, I'll go later. And then I thought, what if later never comes? What if I squandered away my chance at later, and I'm not going to get a lead later? Well, luckily for me, um, I went through a lot of protocols, a lot of natural things. I became a master herbalist before I did this whole book writing thing. But through that process of sharing my story, this is how this whole journey came about, but now I help people market and share their stories through books and grow their business this way. So I got better. Luckily for me, there's a lot of people who do not get better, and I have friends who have passed away from Lyme disease. But one of the very first things that I did, which goes back to my shoes, is when I started getting better, I was like, you know what, I'm gonna go back and get those shoes. I had gotten rid of all my shoes. All my clothes were comfortable clothes. All my clothes were from garage sales because I said, you don't deserve to have better than this because you're laying in bed. You have no contribution. You, you're doing nothing for society here except laying in bed. And I thought, 25 cents, 50 cents here and there, you know, on a shirt or a pair, pair of sweatpants, that's, that's enough for me, that's all I deserved. Besides, we were spending so much money on my treatment, you know. So anyways, as I got better, I started thinking, wow, is this going to stick? Am I really better now? And I decided that I was going to go out and get my hair and my heel shoes. I had gotten rid of all the other ones because I thought I would never get a chance to go back out again. I had vertigo, so I was like, you know, and I had to hold on to my husband to like aim to get to the door. And so the shoes to me became the symbol of I've kicked it and I'm taking my life back taking my power back, and I decided I'm not living life with regrets. I'm not going to look back in bitterness. I'm not going to look back and say, I said yes when I really was screaming no inside. So if you see me around town doing things like this, you'll see me in signature shoes. If you see me at the mall walking around, you'll see me in tennis shoes, though. <laughs> so all that to say that I encourage every single one of you Probably each and every one of you here has somebody or has your own story of something that's happened, something that has made you reevaluate re what you're doing with your life. And I hope that with my story, you see that, you know what, things can be overcome. There are a lot of things that I do. One of them was a big mindset shift in being able to get better, purely just not accepting that the doctor said there was no cure. You can go ahead and accept that, or you can take your, hand, take your life into your own hands and decide. The last thing I want to share with you today is that when you're in business, when you're growing your following, failure is required. And I say that because so many times I see entrepreneurs out there who try one thing and go, oh, that didn't work, it's not for me. Or, oh, I did that once before, and it might work for them, but it doesn't work for me. And then they give up. You know, after 18 months, a lot of entrepreneurs just throw the towel in. And I hate 
hate seeing that. I hate seeing it so much. Because we, when we are educated, let's say, right, we might learn to make jewelry, we might learn to sew or, or make lipstick and things like that. And even as a master herbalist, when I became certified with that, and when I became a certified um, business coach, they taught us how to do what we needed to do to create our products or create our business, but they didn't tell us how to run a business. And that's where I really enjoy working with people to create their marketing, to look at what is really impacting those bottom lines. I love words, because <laughs> I call the words lady quite often, but I also love numbers. And numbers matter, especially the ones that have dollar signs in front of them. <laughs> and you need to know what is going on with your gross profit, right, and your net. You need to know those numbers. You need to know if it's going to cost you $2 to get somebody in the door as a lead, how much is that person actually going to buy? If it costs you $2 to get somebody in the door and they're going to, on average, purchase $100 or $1,000 worth of goods and services, it's worth it. But if you're going to spend $300 on a lead and your product is $200, that's not going to work out. And I think that's where a lot of the disconnect is. So I just want to leave you with that, that failure is an option because we have to tweak, we have to run the numbers, we have to know where in the process of that equation of getting that client through the door all the way to where they're going to buy, what's going into it, all the numbers that go into it. All right, so does anybody have any questions for me regarding writing a book, marketing your business? I know I, I didn't have a lot of time to go into a lot of detail, but does anybody have any questions? On average, start to finish, how long does it take for you to write and publish a book? Okay, good question. So her question was on average, how long does it take to write and publish a book? So I have a program that's called Easy Writer Guaranteed Amazon Bestseller Program. And in that program, we go through everything, like from deciding your topic all the way to publishing it and getting it to bestseller. And the people who have been in there, they've written their books in about 60 days to about four months. One of the things that I didn't mention was that I really, really advise people to write short read books. And the reason being is that we all have short attention spans. <laughs> and when you see a thick book, you kind of go, oh, I gotta wait until I'm on vacation or you know, the kids are out of the house for the weekend or something. Even though we might really want the content, we don't find the time to actually read it. I, I, I have plenty of books at home, I love books, I have plenty of them that sit on the shelf. But the ones that get read are the ones that give me a focused solution and it's gonna be quick to read. So I recommend that people write books that, that others can read in about two hours. So that equates to about 75 pages. So if you can write a page and a half a day for 60 days, your book is done. Yes? Were you a writer before this? I actually kind of was. <laughs> so thanks for the question. Um, I have a degree in actuarial math, so I'm a mathematician. My mom actually told me I wasn't allowed to go to art school, so I decided for some reason to get a highly technical degree. But in high school, I was I wrote poetry. Um, I was editor-in-chief of the newspaper, the yearbook. Like I dominated everything that had to do with words. So yes, I did that, so I was always a writer. Um, and how this all evolved was that I had this love of marketing, this love of words, and how different words could mean different things, and they could persuade and things like that. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but I'm Asian. And uh, <laughs> in the Asian culture, telling somebody how to improve, or telling them that they've done something wrong here or there, is a sign of love. And it was very hard for me as a child growing up in America, you know, to understand what my mom really meant. And so I really got fascinated with words and things. And um, it wasn't until many, many years later that I realized that in the Asian culture, this is really like a, I care about you enough to, to want you to do better. So let me share with you what you're doing wrong. So it didn't come out very tactfully back then. So I, I had this obsession with the words and I really, really wanted um, as a parent to raise my children 
being somebody who could inspire them, being somebody who would tell them, yes, you can do anything that you want. And not that my mom didn't teach me that, it was just like the other side that, you know. Um, so anyways, I was always fascinated with words. And then the Lyme disease and my story coming out with that, I wrote for Huffington Post. Um, Dr. Phil invited me out to a show, and then they canceled the show. I was like, all ready to like ride this jet and everything, and they canceled the show. Um, but anyways, they found it through Huffington Post. So my friends kept saying, well, you're sharing your story. You're doing so well with the story. So many people are noticing, can you teach me how to do that? Can you teach me how to share my story? And then the story thing grew into story marketing, and then they grew into stories in your book, and then it grew into like this whole marketing thing. So, yeah. Any other questions? What's one of your biggest accomplishments for yourself? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, wow. In business or in life? Either. Well, OK. In business, I would say probably the anthology that I wrote last summer that had 36 people in it. It's the first anthology I did. so. The timeline was really short, and I almost killed my editor. <laughs> so gathering all those people and putting this book together um, as a large group, I really am proud of that. That was recent. Um, in terms of life, the fact that I am still married <laughs> after having gone through Lyme disease, um, it was just, honestly, it was a very hard time. My husband, you know, he lost the wife that he married during that process. Um, and he became an unwilling caregiver, I'm going to say. Um, he's a sweet guy, but he didn't sign up to take care of a sick wife for four years. Um, and there are many times that I did things and said things I shouldn't have said, and he did it as well. And I <laughs> took all his clothes out of the closet, told him I was going to throw them on the lawn, you know, just stuff like that. Um, but I think in terms of life, just getting through that time of being ill, um, and having him through all that still stand by me, even though I was such a horrible, angry, bitter person at that time. I blamed him a lot during that time, and now looking back, it totally wasn't his fault. It was my perspective on everything that was going on with me. So the fact that we are still together <laughs> and now very happily married and crowned all the time, it's just wonderful. So. Oh, yeah, so Lyme does not have a protocol, like I said. So I was on antibiotics for Lyme disease for a long time, and antibiotics kills your guts. It kills everything. So I think recovering from that protocol took me longer in some instances. I didn't know what I was fighting, the bad gut flora or the disease. Um, so I really started looking at protocols that were natural, that weren't going to ruin my body. So as I did that, I thought, oh gosh, I'm, I'm investigating all these herbs and all these other things. Why don't I do something with this? And what was supposed to be a six-month certification took me two and a half years. I had to ask for two extensions because I couldn't concentrate. I was probably sleeping 16 to 18 hours a day. Um, and when I was awake, I couldn't think. And Lyme disease also created slight dyslexia in me. Um, that it was hard for me to read and it was hard for me to jumble the words and like the paragraphs would jump and, and things like that. So it was really hard for me to get through that. But they extended me twice on it and finally got all the way done with it. The first book I wrote was actually a book on detox. And then the second book was my um, graduation paper, which was a herbal journal. We were supposed to highlight, I think it was 10 or 12 different herbs. And I thought, why don't I just make this bigger? Because there's so many more herbs that I like. And um, so I didn't bring that book with me, though. So that one, I, that's an herb journal that's actually on Amazon. Yeah. Do you still practice the group study? Um, I actually used to do like muscle rubs and lip balm and um, things like that, and mixed teas, like detox tea and wellness tea and stuff like that. And I still have a buttload of supplies. <laughs> But I don't really do that anymore. Like my friend will say, hey, I know you still have this stuff. Can you make me a batch of something? But yeah. Somebody else have a question? Yes? Um, I'm 
Star Wars comes out, we're all excited, we're all going to the movies and everything. And what happens the next week, Star Wars is still kind of exciting, but not as many people are going there. And eventually there's another movie that takes over. And that's the same thing that happens with your book. So unless you're going to continue to promote it over and over again, after your bestseller launch, it's just going to kind of start dwindling down in the rankings, just like movies do. Yeah. Um, so just curious, what's the best method that 
that you use are promoting your books? Like I know sometimes mm -hmm. if you sell on Amazon, yes. did you do like a distribution deal with, with stores or with so, investment that you found? Okay, so our question was about distributing the book and selling the book um, and about Amazon. So Amazon is great to get the bestseller title and what I say is after we get the bestseller title, I don't care about Amazon anymore because they're not going to give me the profits that I want. You know, the royalty is really steep there. <laughs> and that's another thing, you know, when, when you go with a publisher, you'll be getting less, fewer royalties from them. Um, so the distribution, when you use CreateSpace and things like that, they have a distribution system. So like if you go on Barnes and Noble, Dot com. My books are on there as well, so that's one way. But really, the main method that I help people with is creating what's called a book funnel. Have you heard of that before? Okay, so a funnel in marketing terms is basically um, where you're gathering, I'm going to say gathering emails, you're gathering a following, you're creating a list of people who like what you do. And we're going to put something out there that markets that, and you're going to create this list, and you can use your book to do that, or you can use something else as a freebie first and then lead them through a what we call nurture sequence and email. So you might have signed up for something, whether it be like an online store, and then you know, you'll know you get things. Like for instance, I'm the Swanson Vitamins, you know? so every once in a while I get this, this email that says, hey, this is on sale, or hey, here's a product we want to promote. So those are like the email sequences that I'm talking about. So you use these in marketing, and you basically get them more interested in you. You nurture them and create this following and then um, run them into either you know, buying your book or your other products. Does that answer your question? So I rather promote my book directly to these people rather than use Amazon. Yeah. Any other questions? I know I've run long, Tika. <laughs> yes? Um, I'm not sure what my question is, but um, I think it's like the written book opposed to the e-books. Is it good to do both? Yeah, good question. So um, most of my clients do have written print books and e-books. Um, you can also do audible books as well. All that connects into Amazon, and then you get just different versions of it. Um, many of my authors as well, I would say probably like 40% have just the e-book, and probably 60% have both. Um, it's nice to have both because then you can bring it to things like this and get them printed off and, and such like that. Ebooks are nice because in terms of marketing, somebody gets your, um, order something from you, you get delivered immediately and they don't have to wait for it because we're impatient people these days, you know. So um, there is a benefit to having one first and then the other. And so here's a secret. In Amazon, when they rank books, an ebook is different than the print book. So if you put both of your books out at the same time, which is not what I suggest, I suggest just doing the ebook first. Um, if you put both books out at the same time, they compete with each other. And then your rankings aren't as good. So we always go with the book first and then create the ebook later. That answer your question? Okay. All right, so we've gone long, but thanks for the questions, and I'll be over here um, if you're interested in any of my books or asking any more questions later. Thanks for coming, everybody.